Welcome to chapter 8 and in this chapter we will talk about cash fraud and internal control and really what this all leads to is how we protect our most liquid asset which is our cash. The really central point to protecting our cash resources is through what's called internal control. And again, not only like the slide says, does it uh, protect our assets, but it ensures that our financial reporting is reliable and that it, is, it upholds company policies and it also promotes efficient operations. If we were a publicly traded company, and when I say publicly traded, I mean that we were traded, uh, you know, that it's a company that's, uh, we sell stock on the New York Stock Exchange, on uh, the NASDAQ. Um, those companies are governed by um, the PCAOB, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And there was a company a number of years ago by the name of Enron. Many of you may be old enough to remember Enron. And if not, there's a great movie on it, uh, the name of which is escaping me. But the debacle with Enron is what led to the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation which then led to the PCAOB and what it requires is for companies to have effective internal controls. They must sorry, evaluate those internal controls and report on those and if they don't it's bad news. Companies that are publicly traded are required to adhere to a framework of internal control and the easiest and um, most common framework for the those companies to adopt is what's called COSO and COSO stands for Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission. They've established uh, they call it five ingredients um, I'm actually reviewing all of this now for my own professional purposes, um, but officially they're called components. And it is the control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, as well as monitoring. And those make up the components to internal control. And within those components, we have uh, the principles here, which I will go through in greater detail. The primary thing that we need to do is establish responsibilities. And I say primary because there's really something that we need to do prior to all of this, which is that we need to have an environment that basically says we need to do things right, we need to follow procedures, and that integrity and ethical standards matter. And that needs to be communicated from the top of the organization down and it's referred to as tone at the top. The upper level management needs to not only just talk the talk when it comes to um, having a good control environment but they need to walk the walk as well. So a company can't just talk about the need to uh, be secure in how it deals with things and then have the corporate officers not following the procedures and having other people observe that. So, um, but outside of that control environment, we then have the nuts and bolts, which is that we've got to have responsibilities. So somebody needs to be responsible for tasks. Um, and then if something goes wrong, you know, they can't all point fingers at one another. If you uh, have ever been at a fast food restaurant or a grocery store or something at shift change and a new cashier is coming in, the first thing that the manager will do before a new order is rung up is they will switch out the cash drawer and they will go count the cash drawer of the cashier who's leaving. And that's because if there's a shortage in the cash drawer, the cashier who, you know, may have 
pocketed a $10 bill or whatever can't then blame it on the cashier who came in later. So we didn't wouldn't just leave the same cash drawer in for everyone to access over the course of a day. Um, and wait and count it at the end of the evening, we would switch out the cash drawers after every shift. And and that's a, just a really basic example, but uh, there you will find that in all kinds of uh, elements uh, of an organization where we've got situations where we can't just have people pointing fingers at one another. Uh, we need to be able to trace problems back to the source. We want to have good records. And so back to the example of the cash drawer, that cash register is going to record internally what those sales are. And there's going to be a, a, a tape associated with that. And the manager is going to be able to run a printout from the register, count up the drawer, and is going to be able to uh, confirm that there's no funds missing. Otherwise, if not, we could just use a cash box. And, you know, the cashier would collect and make change. But the whole purpose behind using a register is so that those transactions can be recorded and we can make sure that the tape uh, balance reconciles with what's actually in the drawer. There are also things that we're going to utilize that are numbered so that if one is missing, it becomes really apparent. So the uh, pre-numbered sales slips, checks that are numbered. Uh, you don't want to have, you know, unnumbered checks because then you don't really know if one of them's missing or not. We want to make sure that we bond key employees. And what does that mean? Uh, a bond is an insurance policy and it can be purchased from, uh, you know, many insurance companies sell them. And it, for employees that have a lot of cash handling exposure, um, maybe they're the vault manager at the bank or something, we want to make sure that if they walk off with any money that there's going to be some sort of uh, recovery for that through an insurance policy. The bonding agencies are, are pretty strict about who they will give, uh, who they will cover under a bond. So, you know, somebody who's got a criminal record for, um, you know, forgery or something like that is not going to be bondable. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, sometimes I have students that have aspirations of doing work in this field that have criminal records that I know will probably impact their ability to be bonded. And um, so uh, that's, and when I have criminal clients uh, who I know work in fields that that's going to be an issue before we're talking about plea agreements and what they may or may not plead guilty to, I often will say, you know, if you think you're going to have to be bonded in your job, this conviction is going to be a problem for you. Um, so we need to make sure that the person who keeps the records is different from the person who was in control of the assets. This is exactly the reason that the cashier who's going off shift doesn't count their own cash drawer. The cash, the uh, manager is going to uh, count the cash drawer. Um, if the cashier is in control of counting the cash drawer, chances are there's going to be no, you know, no uh, shortage in the drawer because they're uh, able to cover up their own mistakes. Similarly, if, you know, the, the cashier and the manager could certainly collude and agree that they could, uh, the manager is going to sign off uh, on the shorted cash drawer and the cashier is going to cut the manager in on some of the proceeds. And again, that's called collusion. And it, it's very difficult to have good controls when you have employees that are colluding to thwart those controls. Um, we're going to divide responsibility for things so that um, we're not going to have multiple people doing the same thing because then again we're back to the finger pointing of who did something wrong but we're going to have um, larger tasks broken down into smaller pieces that we can trace the smaller piece back but if there's a problem 
with the entire situation, um, somebody else that's involved in it is likely to discover it. So when we uh, make bank deposits, for example, the person that I send to make the bank deposit is not the same person who collects the bank statement from the mailbox when it shows up and handles the bank account reconciliation because it would be very easy for somebody to skim off the deposit after I sent them out the door with it and if they're the one that collects the bank statements from the post office and then does the physical reconciliation of the bank statement um, very easy to cover up so you want to have separate people doing those functions. Uh, applying technological controls and you know having the cash register tape, uh, time cards where somebody's punched in and punched out. You want to have rules about not punching in or punching out somebody else. Uh, if you have uh, scanners where you have like biometric fingerprint or retina scanners that generally will prohibit somebody from uh, clocking somebody else in or out. Uh, they're not foolproof and sometimes they're not even accurate and will sometimes not even record the right person doing the right thing, um, but at least they will most likely prevent the wrong person from uh, doing, you know, committing a, a fraud. We want to make sure that we look over our processes and have a fresh set of eyes. Have somebody else come in and look at our activities and these are called independent auditors and they will come in totally unrelated to our company. They're paid to come in. If we are a publicly traded company, they are, we are mandated to have somebody independent come in and look at our books and records and basically evaluate how well we do with internal control. Now the advent of technology has eliminated some fraud risk and presented a whole new set of fraud risks. Um, on balance though um, the advent of technology has helped to uh, over the manual process in terms of accuracy and um, also the increase in e-commerce. We can have a paper trail and I say paper trail, a digital trail. You can have log uh, records of who's logged in under what password at what point for how long what they accessed. Uh, none of that stuff was available when we had manual systems. Um, but we also have the risk of hacking and um, things that are associated with that. So it's been really kind of a, a double-edged sword, but on balance, the technical systems um, using technology are still superior to back when we had the old paper and pencil system. Another sort of iteration of technology is um, this blockchain uh, concept is something that came about with the advent of cryptocurrency which didn't exist a decade ago and what blockchain is it's a a virtual ledger system for the cryptocurrency it uh, basically allows transactions to be performed anonymously but that there's always a running total of somebody's cryptocurrency account balance. You can't modify it without any sort of records and so uh, it is auditable. Uh, there's a, a good paper trail or, or digital trail for it uh, but this is again something that arose as a result of cryptocurrency. Now the best internal controls are still not perfect. There are instances where the best controls can be thwarted um, and whether intentionally or unintentionally. So you know sometimes people just make mistakes, they're careless, they're you know they're, they're not paying attention, it's the end of the day or they're, they're you know working 12 hours a day at the end of their busy season and they accidentally you know 
pick the wrong check for, you know, the check from the wrong account and put that in the printer and write the, the, you know, the payment out of the wrong account. Things like that happen. Um, you know, ideally you would have controls, but you know, sometimes people get tired and careless and sloppy and, you know, mistakes like that happen. You can also have things that are done intentionally. Um, you know, this happens sometimes when, uh, you know, people believe that they are not going to get caught. And so if they think they're not going to get caught, they might commit a little bit of a fraud. And if they get away with it, then the size of the fraud may expand beyond that. Uh, generally, that's a situation where internal controls have been manipulated or when you've got two employees that have colluded together and maybe you've got managers that are overriding controls um, or uh, yeah, employees in two different areas that are covering for one another. So um, you always want to be on the lookout for collusion where you've got two or more employees that may be working together to commit a fraud. The sort of the, the hallmark framework for looking at fraud is through what's called the fraud triangle. And it has, there are three points to the fraud triangle, opportunity, pressure, and rationalization. Those are quite often the, you know, what we see whenever, whenever I have represented an embezzler, um, it has always involved all three of these points. Uh, there's an opportunity. Maybe there are weak internal controls. And absent the other two elements, weak internal controls might not result in somebody committing a fraud. But now you add some pressure. Maybe somebody, uh, you know, has had a major, you know, car repair or something, or they, or they can't afford to pay their rent, or, you know, their spouse is out of work and they're going to lose their apartment. So that opportunity now gets combined with some pressure. Even then, you're probably not going to have a fraud committed until you get that third element, which is the rationalization. And the rationalization can come from sometimes, you know, sort of legitimate situations where somebody's maybe being asked to work a lot of uncompensated for overtime. And so then they start to feel like the company owes them money. And this was exactly the scenario that I had with a town clerk that I represented where there was lots of overtime that was being required and no, you know, no compensation for the overtime. And so there was opportunity and then some financial pressures and then this rationalization. So you always want to make sure that you're not asking your people to work off the clock that, you know, so even if one of these other two or, or both of these other things exists, if you can at least do what you can from the employer side to remove any potential rationalization, uh, you might thwart a, a fraud. But cutting off the opportunity will certainly uh, be the best defense because then the pressure and the rationalization lacks any sort of meaningful outlet if there's no opportunity to actually commit the fraud. Internal controls can be simple or they can be really complex and a company needs to assess what the level of risk is and the cost of having a particular control performed. And if the cost of the control is actually more than what it would save the company if the control failed and the money was lost, then it, it may not be worth, you may just accept the level of risk and move on or, you know, find some other, uh, maybe you get insurance to cover that or something like that. But um, sometimes hiring an extra person just so there's another set of eyes may not support the level of theft that, you know, that, that somebody's salary and benefits and something versus what could be lost might not weigh out. So you might just say, mm, you know, we have insurance for that and we're not going to add to our staffing um, to prevent a, a fraud from occurring. 
So I'm going to stop this video here and go on to talking about cash and cash equivalents and we'll loop that into our discussion of internal controls as well.